Morning, everyone. I hope you're all well. You're all had a good weekend. Um, beautiful weather on Saturday, so I hope you got to enjoy it a little bit. Um, I was talking to some of you on Thursday, and I think you were all out enjoying the sun, which was fab. Um, yesterday was horrendous. But anyways, I'm going to continue on with Kensuke's Kingdom. Um, we're on to chapter four now, which is Gibbons and Ghosts. It's quite a long chapter. It's about 25 pages. I'm going to split it up halfway. Um, so it's quite a lot happens in this one, too. Chapter four, Gibbons and Ghosts. The terrors came fast, one upon another. The lights of the Peggy Sue went away into the dark of the night, leaving me alone in the ocean, alone with the certainty that they were already too far away, that my cries for help would, would not possibly be heard. I thought then of the sharks cruising beneath the black water beneath me, scenting me, already searching me out, homing in on me, and I knew that there would be no hope. I would be eaten alive. Either that or I would drown slowly. Nothing could save me. I trod water, frantically searching for the impenetrable darkness about me for something, anything to swim towards. There was nothing. Then suddenly a glimpse of white in the sea, the breaking of a wave perhaps. But there was no waves. Stella, it had to be. I was so thankful, so relieved not to be all alone. I called out and swam towards her. She would keep bobbing away from me, vanishing, reappearing, then vanishing again. She see she had seemed so near, but it took several minutes of hard swimming before I came close enough to reach out and touch her. Only then did I realise my mistake. Stella's head was mostly black. This was white. It was my football. I grabbed it and clung on, tr feeling the unexpected and wonderful buoyancy of it all. I held on, treading water and calling for Stella. There was no answer. I called and called. But every time I opened my mouth now, the seawater rushed in. I had to give up. I had to save myself if I could. There was little point in wasting energy by trying to swim. After all, I had nowhere to swim to. Instead, I would simply float. I could, would cling on to my football, tread water gently, and wait for the Peggy Sue to come back. Sooner or later, they had to discover that I was overboard. Sooner or later, they would come start looking for me. I mustn't kick too much, just enough to keep my chin above the water, no more. Too much movement would, would attract the sharks. Morning would come soon. I had to hang on till then. I had to. The water wasn't that cold. I had my football. I had a chance. I kept telling myself over and over again. But the world stayed stubbornly black about me. And I could feel the water slowly chilling me to the death. I tried singing to keep myself from shivering. To take my mind off the sharks. I sang every song I could remember. But after a while, I'd, for I'd, forgot I'd forget the words. Always I came back to the, set, the only song I was sure I could finish, Ten Green Bottles. I sang it out loud again and again. It reassured me to hear the sound of my own voice. It made me feel less alone in the sea. And always I looked for the grey glint of dawn, but it would not come. And it, and it would not come. Sorry, it just repeats itself there. Um, eventually I fell silent and my legs would not kick anymore. I clung to my football, my head drifting into sleep. I knew I mustn't, but I couldn't help myself. My hands kept slipping off the ball. I was fast losing the, la the last of my strength. I would go down, down to the bottom of the sea and lie in my grave amongst the seaweed and the sailor's bones and the shipwrecks. The strange thing was, I didn't really mind. I didn't care, not anymore. I floated away into sleep, into my dreams. And in my dreams, I saw a boat gliding towards me, silent over the sea. The Peggy Sue. Dear, dear Peggy Sue. They had come back for me. I knew they would. Strong arms grabbed me. I was hauled upwards and out of the water. I lay there on the deck, gasping for air like a landed fish. Someone was bending over me, shaking me, talking to me. I could not understand a word that was being said, but it didn't matter. I felt Stella's hot breath on my face, her tongue licking my ear. She was safe. I was safe. All was well. I was woken by a howling, like the howling of a gale towards, through the mast, excuse me. I looked about me. There was no mast above me. There were no sails. No movement under me either. No breath of wind. Stella Artois was barking, some, but some way off. I was not in a boat, but lying stretched out on sand. The howling became a screaming, a fearful crescendo of screeching that died away its own echoes. I sat up. I was on a beach, a broad, white sweep of sand, with Trees growing thick and lush behind me, right to to the down to the beach. Then I saw Stella prancing about in the shallows. I called her and she came bounding up out of the sea to greet me, her tail circling wildly. When all leaping and licking and hugging were done, I struggled to my feet. I was weak all over. I looked about me. The wide blue sea was as empty as the cloudless sky above. No Peggy Sue, no boat, nothing, no one. 
I called again and again for my mother and my father. I called until the tears came and I could call no more, until I knew there was no point. I stood there for some time, trying to work out how I had got here, but it, how it was that I had survived. I had such confused memories of being picked up, of being on board the Peggy Sue, but I knew now I couldn't have been. I must have dreamed it, dreamed the whole thing. I must have clung to my football and kept myself afloat until I was washed up. I thought of my football then, but it was nowhere to be seen. Stella, of course, was unconcerned about all the whys and wherefores. She kept bringing me sticks to throw and would go galloping after them into the sea like without a care in the world. Then came the howling again from the trees and the hackles went up on the back of Stella's neck. She charged up the beach, barking and barking until she was sure she had silenced the last of the echoes. It was a musical, plaintive howling this time, not menacing at all. I thought I recognised it. I had heard howling like it once before on a visit to London Zoo. Gibbons, funky gibbons, my father had called them. I still don't know why to this day, but I love the, the sound of the word funky. Perhaps it was why I had remembered what they were. It's only gibbons, I told Stella, just funky gibbons. They won't hurt, hurt us. But I couldn't be sure at all I was right. From where, I from where I now stood, I could see that the forest grew more sparsely up the side of a great hill some way inland, and it occurred to me then that if I could reach the bare rocky outcrop at the summit, I would be able to see further out to sea, or perhaps there'd be some house or farm further inland, or maybe a road, and I could find someone to help. But if I left the beach and they came back looking for me, what then? I decided I would have to take that chance. I set off at a run. Stella Artois at my heels, and soon found myself in the cooling shade of the forest. I discovered a narrow track going uphill in the right direction, I thought, so I followed it, only slowing to a walk when the hill became too steep. See, steep excuse me. The forest was alive with creatures. Birds cr cackled and screeched high above me, and always the howling wailed and wafted through the trees, but more distantly now. It wasn't the sounds of the forest that bothered me, though it was the eyes. I felt as though I was being watched by a thousand inquisitive eyes. I thought Stella did too, for she for she had been strangely quiet ever since we had entered the forest, constantly glancing up at me for reassurance and comfort. I did my best to give it, but she could sense that I too was frightened. What had seemed at first to be a short hike now seemed like a great expedition into the interior. We, em we emerged, exhausted from the trees, climbing clambered, excuse me, laboriously up a rocky scree and stood at long last on the peak. The sun was blazing down. I had not really felt the burning heat of it till then. I had scanned the horizon. If there was a sail somewhere out there in the haze, I could not see it. And then it came to me that even if I were to see a sail, what could I do? I couldn't light a fire. I had no matches. I knew about cavemen running, running, rubbing sticks together, but I had never tried it. I looked around me now. See, see, see. Nothing but sea on all sides. I was on an island. I was alone. That's where I'll leave it for today. So we're going to finish off that chapter tomorrow. In the meantime, hope you have a great day. Hope you're being good for your parents and your carers. And look after yourself. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.